Joining the show now, James Livingston, who is a professor of history at Rutgers University, where he's taught since 1988. He's also the author of four books, the most recent one uh, titled Against Thrift, Why Consumer Culture is Good for the Economy, the Environment, and Your Soul. Anyway, it sounds like the making's for a great debate. I'm looking forward to uh, this interview. Uh, by the way, his earlier books are titled Origins of the Federal Reserve System, Money, Class, and Corporate Capitalism, uh, also Pragmatism and the Political Economy of Cultural Revolution, and his first book, Oh, no, that's, I'm reading in reverse order. The, the next one, uh, Pragmatism, Feminism, and Democracy, Rethinking the Politics of American History. Professor, welcome to the show. Hi, Peter. Nice to have you. All right, well, let's, let's get right into this. I mean, the title right. of your most recent book is intriguing me. Uh, you're yeah. saying that um, thrift is a bad thing, uh, that we don't want any savings, that we just want – uh, consumers to go out there and spend as much as possible. Uh, is that is that your thesis? Uh, no. <laughs> the thesis <laughs> is that um, that consumer spending drives the economy, and we have to face up to that fact. Um, now, the the obverse of that is that, and this is this is the part that's going to upset you a lot. That private investment does not drive growth; consumer spending does. Um, and if I'm right about that, and that's the economics of the case, then we have no choice except to embrace consumer culture, and that means reexamining the the virtues of thrift, at least. Well, if all it takes is consumer spending to drive an economy, why is there any poverty in the world? I mean, there are plenty of consumers in Africa. Uh, why isn't there a boom there? Why don't you have all kinds of economic growth? You got plenty of people that have nothing. I mean, if, if there were ever people that needed things, it's people in Africa. I mean, a lot of them barely have clothes. Uh, you would think that, uh, there should be a boom, right? I mean, there's plenty of consumers. They got lots of trees. They can print all kinds of money. So why don't they just print up a bunch of money, dump it on all the tribes, and just let everything go? Well, now, I mean, you, you really want me to take that question seriously, right? Okay, so here's what I'm Well, yeah, well, you're that saying up. that consumer spending drives the economy. So if consumer spending drives an economy, if that's all you need is consumers with money in their pockets, uh, then why don't why don't why do we have any poverty? I, you know, why don't the poor people well, just, just answer, grow the economy by spending? You just answered the question for me. Money in their pockets. It seems to me that what? the key to increasing consumer spending, and that is ending the boom bust cycle that we've endured since the mid 1980s is to put more money in the hands of consumers. Now, I'm talking domestically for the time being. Now, we can go... Right, but, I'm, but why doesn't it... All right, well, let's, say, let's go to something simple. Let's say a bunch of people were stranded on an island, and they had nothing. They were just stranded on an island, and then a helicopter came by and dumped a bunch of dollar bills on the island. Just okay, like so how, how, are, how is the existence of dollar bills going to change their situation? You know, it's, it's a really good question, and I guess we'd have to go back to Robinson Crusoe. I don't think it would. Do you? I mean, I, you know, I. Well, I no. no if idea. Robinson Crusoe had a million dollars in his pocket, what? Would, how would that change his circumstances? He got me. I, you know, we'd have to go back. Well, to you just told me that. You just told me that if he had a lot of money in his pocket, how would how would he grow his economy just because he had money? I, but see, it, it, it seems to me a specious question. If you want to talk about the reality of our times, then it seems to me we need to talk about the distribution of income between labor and capital, between investment and consumption. If you want to talk about well, that, I'm just trying to break it down to a, a smaller example. But, but I mean, what but you're so saying is, if, example, if American you know, citizens, you know, ahead. you know better than anybody. It's not an example that works. It didn't work for Defoe. <laughs> And it didn't work for anybody else, so I don't see what the point of, of retreating to an island is. Well, because I think if we put it in this, into a simple context, if you're saying that just giving people money grows an economy, I think that if it works in a big economy, it should work in a small economy. I don't really I see think, the difference. I, so think that's a, I think that's a fallacy of economic theory, that if it works big, it works small. I think, I think you cannot compare Robinson Crusoe's island to – the macro economy we're dealing with in the United States of America at this moment. I don't think you can do it. But so what? So what? So what is your given your view? What do you think the U.S. government should do right now, uh, and and how would that help the U.S. economy? 
I think, um, okay, well, long term, I think we need to change the tax code so that um, taxes on corporate profits are raised. I think we need to change the tax code so that, so that, wait, <laughs> so that uh, taxes on personal incomes above, say, $500,000 are raised. That's revenue. All right, so let me just stop I you for a second before. Sure. So hold on. So corporate tax rates right now are 35%. That's the corporate rate. How much higher do you think we should raise it? Well, I guess maybe we're talking about closing the loopholes that, that encourage the export of capital. Um, I think we're talking about making corporations pay their fair share, as you know better than anybody. All right, but do you? But you don't want to. You don't want to increase the marginal rate then from thirty-five percent. You think that's the right rate? No, I think I think uh, I think thirty-five percent might work as long as we can make corporations pay. As you know, most corporations pay almost nothing, and their All share. All right, well, a lot of corporations pay nothing. Yeah. Okay. So you the you the just want to close of, some the of the loopholes in federal revenues. And the share of corporate taxes and federal revenues has been falling precipitously since the 1960s. Again, as you know better. All right, than so let me just let me just follow up. So, you want to? What about on the individual level? Where do you want yeah, to bring think, the rates on the people that make over five hundred thousand? Where do I want them to be? I think I think yeah. we could we could start by going back to the, the rates of the 1990s. But you know, eventually we might want to consider the rates of the 1950s. Okay, as but ideally, that's ideally. What do you think the ideal rate? Remember, it's you, you can do you can decide it. You're like, you're the president in Congress. So where should sure. we put rates? What should the rate be? Well, you know, um, um, that's a really good question. <laughs> that's a practical question that I haven't yet addressed. But let's say. Well, but you think um, you're you're saying that we should raise rates on the upper income people? Just how high yes, should they well, go? Well, let's let's say that 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 you're right to include yourself in the one percent. Okay. You know, the one percent mm -hmm. that, that okay. I think the one percent should be taxed at a rate at least, let's say, fifty percent. That's just off the top of my head. Okay, okay. so let, and that's that's the federal rate. So if somebody lives in New York City, you're saying they should be paying basically sixty percent in tax, right? Yeah, that that would be fine with me. Yeah. All right. So let's say somebody. So that means for a corporation, if I'm if I live in New York and and I'm going to buy stock in a business to help it grow, if that right. business earns a dollar and pays thirty five percent in tax, there's sixty five cents left, and then I pay sixty percent on a personal level and I get my dividend. So that means I only get twenty six cents. So basically, you're saying every dollar that a corporation <laughs> earns, only twenty four cents of it should go to the shareholder, and the rest of it should go to government. That's not a bad idea for the following reason. What do okay, corporate so, profits do? <laughs> wait, wait. Why don't you answer yeah. my question now? What do corporate, right. corporate profits do? What are they for? Do they actually Well, obviously, they, well, there's they, two, they, they, do they do two, two things. That They do two things. They reward the shareholders for taking the risk of funding the company in the first place and, and putting their capital at risk. So they reward the shareholders for making the investment. And then, number two, they provide the capital for the businesses to grow, to make the investments in plant and equipment that can increase future productivity and hiring more workers and growing the economy. So if you're going to say that 75 percent of all corporate profits should go to the government, that's going to destroy the economy. Peter, I know you haven't read the book yet, but the central argument of part one of the book is that that is the fundamental fallacy of economic theory and economic practice of our time and of the 20th century. What you're saying is that private investment drives growth by providing capital and creating jobs. My argument, and I can demonstrate it with way too many facts and figures, is that you're wrong. They don't. These profits. Well, what drives growth? In, in your, what drives growth? Well, turn it around. Investment follows the curve of consumer demand, not the other way around. No, so no, but consumers say, can't demand anything that hasn't been produced. Yeah, How can consumers that's buy true. something that doesn't now, exist? Now, now what you're doing is reinstating state, Shay's law, just like George Gilder did way back in the day. And, and it seems to me that's another fallacy of supply-side economics. Well, so you're saying that the, it, that supply doesn't create demand. That demand, the, the mere function of people wanting something, magically brings it into existence. Did I say magically? No, you said magically. But you're absolutely well. Right. The, how, well, then how does it? Well, does well how does it? Own demand. I'm saying that Shay's law has been invalidated for about a hundred okay. years. Okay. All right. How does demand create supply? Then you tell me how people wanting things creates things. 
Well, let's see. If you're an investor and let's say you're, you're dealing at the retail level, you're, you're waiting for, you're looking for curves, trends, and consumer demand. Now, doesn't that make sense? So you're investing where you think people might be demanding goods. But where is the stuff coming from that the consumers are buying? How well, does it – if it you're talking about a retailer, <laughs> if you're talking about a retailer – of course, it has I'm to trying be to use, and of course, in, in that sense, investment might have to be made. We'll go back to that question. But in what a do minute. you mean, might? How yeah. else? How else are you going to produce something unless you have the tools, unless you have the equipment to, to make good it? Question. Very good question. Your, see, but your question has to boil down to what investment is. You simply assume that investment is take some profits, you build some plant and equipment. And jobs are created, and therefore there's consumer demand. You're wrong. That's not how it works. It doesn't. How work does it work? Anymore. How does it work? Since 1919, maybe since 1910, it's it's the statistics are, are obscure here. But after 1919, it's pretty clear that investment, net investment, out of profits to increase the stock of capital. Uh, you know, we're, I have to. I have to cut you off. We got a commercial, so gather your thought. Sure. I'm really. I want to hear this explanation when we get back. Anyway, you're listening to the Peter Schiff Show here at ShiftRadio.com. We'll be right back. This is Peter Schiff here at ShiftRadio.com, talking with Professor James Livingston, uh, history professor, economist, author. Uh, his l most recent book. Uh, against thrift, why consumer culture is good for the economy, the environment, and the soul. Anyway, before the break, Jamie, you were going to explain to me how it is that goods come into existence without investment. Is that is that the idea? No, not without investment. But um, the trend of the 20th century since 1910 and certainly measurable since 1919, and Simon Kuznets was the pioneer here. Um, he's the guy who invented the national income product accounts. What everybody, well, not everybody, but what many, many economists noticed beginning in the 19. 30s, but then in the 1950s, was that net private investment was atrophying. That is to say, it was declining rapidly. Gross investment stayed pretty much the same, but net private investment was declining. Um, so well, you're not you're talking about in America, right? You're not talking about the entire world, just the United I'm States. Not about, I'm not talking about the entire world just yet, um, but yeah, mm -hmm. it, yeah, okay. So. Yeah, I agree. Well, then, we invest what, uh, it, investment went what, down a lot in America. That's why we had to import yeah. all these things from the rest of the world. That's why we have these huge trade deficits. That's that's that, that's one way to, to look at it. Um, I prefer to look at it this way: that that the replacement and maintenance of the existing capital stock is all we need to do to increase productivity and output. So, and in that sense, you're not creating jobs by replacing and maintaining the capital stock. You're just increasing productivity and output, but not creating jobs. So, but if so we were increasing productivity and output, we wouldn't have the trade deficits. The fact that we have the trade deficits shows that we're not increasing that productivity and output. We're simply importing the things that we're no longer producing because we're not investing enough and we're running I up these huge uh, deficits. I think that's simply wrong. I think, I think productivity, in fact, has measurably increased, and Alan Greenspan was the person who most noticed it. Beginning the late eight, uh, 1980s. Well, then, well, well, then why do we have all these trade deficits? Why don't we have surpluses? If we're so much more productive, why aren't we exporting all the stuff we're producing? Why aren't we exporting? I, I don't know. But if you're talking about tangible manufactured goods, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. But what about the export of our services? What about the you know, uh, well, what about that? It's part of these these. Well, we're, we're, so well, but we have a trade debt. But we have but the, the services are included in the deficit. So. Even, okay, you know, here, we have a net this, deficit in goods and services. Let me let me turn this around. Why is it important to worry about a trade deficit? What's wrong with a trade deficit? Well, don't you think going into debt is a problem? If we have to pay back, you know, we're, we're, we're flooding the world with our IOUs that we have to pay interest on, and eventually we have to repay the principal. Uh, we have an, a huge debt. We're the world's biggest debtor nation. You, you don't see any problem in, in accumulating massive amounts of debt? Uh, not so far, no. I don't, actually. <laughs> um, and I don't think there's anything well, what, wrong what with the trade deficit either. Because what about the budget deficits? Is there anything wrong with the budget deficits? For the time being, I don't think so. Um, and I so think, you don't I, think you don't, a fifteen trillion dollar debt doesn't bother you? Uh, no, not right now. It doesn't because I don't see. I don't. Well, see would it ever bother you? Would a twenty trillion dollar national debt bother you? 
Well, gee, I don't know. I guess it would, it would depend on the ratio between the revenues available and the deficit, right? And what well, the rev- right now the government is spending a dollar and forty cents for every dollar it, it, it collects. I mean, isn't that a huge gap? Doesn't that bother you? Isn't isn't the question you should be asking? How do we renew growth so that these government deficits might shrink? I mean, isn't I mean, well, isn't that the piece? well how do we? Well. How, we, we've never seen government deficits shrink in the, ever since we started running them up. But well, what do you true. think is going to shrink the deficit? How in the world, Peter, for say, how in the world can you say that if we ran surpluses in the 1990s? Come on. No, we didn't. Like, the, every year of the 1990s, the national debt went up. There wasn't a single year in the 1990s where we ended the year owing less than we started the year. So the deficits always go up. But what do you think the government could do right now to create go, growth and bring down the debt? I think the way to create growth is to raise taxes on corporate profits so that we can might we might use that revenue to fund job growth for the time being. That's but job growth from where? If you're raising taxes on corporations, I'm assuming we're going to have less jobs created by the corporations. So is the government going to take the tax money it gets from the corporations and use it to hire more government workers? Is that what you're talking about? No. I guess, I, here, I guess you look at it this way. Um, well, how do we create up. jobs by raising taxes on corporations? I don't see the connection there. I think I think I'm going to answer the first question you you, you asked me. Okay, you you've been throwing this word investment around, um, and it seems to me that you're obscuring the simple fact that since the 1950s, so-called residential investment—that is to say, consumers' purchase of homes of their houses and government spending—had been factored into investment. So no, I don't consider us, that investment. Well, the national income and product mm-hmm. accounts do, however. Yeah, so. well, government spending is not investment. Now, building, you know, really? homes, really? yes, the housing stock is important. Why then, but why then do the NIPA people <laughs> say, call it that? Then, well, you know, I don't care what they want to call it. Government spending is an investment. But I, I'm really curious, though. How, okay. You're saying well, that then, we create we jobs by argument. raising taxes. But let me just – this is a question I'd love you to answer. How do we create wait, wait, jobs? I want you to by... answer my question. Why, why do you get to define investment and not the national? Well, why do they? But th- this is a more important question because I got to know oh, the answer okay. to this. How do we create? How do we create jobs by raising taxes on corporations? I think we create jobs by redistributing income to begin with, away. Well, to who? Profits, towards wages, away from capital towards labor. But how do we do that? We raise ta- so we raise taxes we, on corporations. The, what does the government do with the money? Hmm? I guess it I, I guess it builds infrastructure in in partnership with private enterprise, as John Kerry's infrastructure bank proposed. I, th- I guess we could do that. That would be a form. Okay, of so what so what your idea then is for the government to raise taxes on the private sector and use the money to fund jobs creating in infrastructure spending. So the key to economic that's growth and that, job that, creation that, that, is that to empower the federal government and that, take money out of the private sector. Idea. That that seems that seems like a really good idea to me. But here, let me ask you this. All right, so why didn't it work? You, you, why didn't it work wait, in the wait, wait, Soviet wait, wait, Union? Let me ask you a question, Peter. Let me but ask why didn't it work in the Soviet Union? That's what they did. What are you talking about? Who's talking about the Soviet Union? But, well, well, that's what well, you're talking about doing what they no, did. Not. You're saying that I'm we can create wealth and jobs by having the government spend the money. Let yeah. me point something out. You're talking about the Soviet Union. I'm not talking about the Soviet Union. I'm well, yes, you are. You just don't know, make the connection. Private... You're, you're, you've got the same economic plan that the Soviets had. That's so ridiculous. I don't even know how to respond. I mean, <laughs> Well, what do you call I mean, it? It's not capitalism what you're talking about. It's not free actually, markets. Actually, the whole book that I wrote, if you, 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 you haven't seen any of it, I'm sure, um, the, the subtitle, <laughs> used to include the phrase, how to save capitalism. So, um, I mean, this is why it, it's But laughable. you don't save it by destroying it. That's the mistake Bush made. I, I, I want it, You save capitalism by practicing it, by, by letting it work, not by, not by preventing it from working and substituting socialism. I don't want to save that kind of capitalism. I don't want to save socialism labeled as capitalism. I want the real thing. Anyway, James, look, I got to have you back on the show. We we got to continue this discussion at some point in more depth. I really, I really want to hear more of what you have to say uh, in, in, a, in a longer period of time. But anyway, hey, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate it.